What was that? Ashley! Where are you? Eileen? Chill! Mary? It's me, Tris! Snap out of it! I can't. When it comes to the most iconic and memorable horror franchises of all time, it doesn't matter who you ask. Silent Hill and Resident Evil are always among the first answers. In fact, they're not only critically acclaimed in the horror field alone, but they're also recognized by the general gaming community for their impact on the entire industry. Even though other games with similar themes and vibes came out during their rise, they simply remained the undisputed champions that can never be competed with when it comes to popularity. From Pyramid Head's creepy presence to Albert Wesker's disturbing mind, these games have etched unforgettable figures into gaming history. Whether it's the eerie soundscapes of Silent Hill or the oppressive tension of Resident Evil's decaying environments, these games excel at building an atmosphere that chills you to the bone. Each franchise pioneered and refined horror mechanics, influencing the countless games that followed, and even today, their impact can still be seen. Beyond the scares, both series weave compelling narratives that stay with you long after the credits roll. You can feel a deep connection with their protagonists, but their antagonists also stick in your mind for many reasons, forcing you to be interested in learning their history and backstory as if they're actually real figures in real life. However, even though Resident Evil and Silent Hill technically are not in the same category and have different styles for certain audiences, people over the years could not avoid comparing them to each other and creating some sort of rivalry between them. Just like there's Coca-Cola and Pepsi, Ferrari and Lamborghini, DC and Marvel, PlayStation and Xbox, many people also couldn't ignore the rivalry between Silent Hill and Resident Evil, even if it was hidden. But regardless of whether you believe this rivalry makes sense or not, the actual fact is that the rivalry between their companies, Capcom and Konami, was a real thing. And it was mainly about who could help their game survive the test of time and keep its commercial success going. But the real question is, why Resident Evil passed the test of time and is still at the top of the horror gaming pyramid even today after decades of its initial launch? Oh, you gotta be kidding me! While Silent Hill went into oblivion and became a lost franchise that is mostly remembered today as a precious memory in people's gaming journeys, or as an unforgettable experience that will never be matched again. To answer this question, we need to break it down into multiple points that resulted in this situation, because there is actually more than one reason behind the survival of one franchise and the decline of the other. Even though Resident Evil and Silent Hill became insanely popular over the years, many people don't know that Silent Hill had a weakness that can also be seen as a strong point at the same time. This weakness is the fact that it was not made to appeal to everyone in the gaming field. While Resident Evil leaned more towards action-oriented gameplay, with combat and confrontations taking center stage, Silent Hill prioritized psychological horror making the player feel vulnerable and emphasizing exploration. Despite the fact that Silent Hill excelled in this aspect and convinced many gamers to become fans of this type of experience, it eventually became a big obstacle to attracting new generations of players as time passed. Another dream. But it seems so real. And if you're familiar with how the entertainment industry works, then you definitely know that failing to appeal to new generations is basically a death sentence for any product. Have you ever wondered why superhero movies dominate Hollywood while other types of films seem to be struggling year after year? 
Well, the logic behind that is simply because for some reason, superhero movies keep getting the attention of audiences of all ages, including new generations, and it's all can be explained in one word, which is fun. They are among the few categories of movies where you can find a 15-year-old kid enjoying watching them as much as a 40-year-old adult. Both Silent Hill and Resident Evil were considered scary by their fans, but a big chunk of players agreed that Resident Evil is definitely more fun. If you're wondering why it's more fun, well, it's simply because, as an action game, it gives you the ability to do more stuff on the screen, and trust me when I tell you that people love this sense of control in games and being able to engage with everything all the time, especially if it's combat and facing enemies. This takes us to the second element that helped Resident Evil lead the popularity race and expand the number of players that it could reach. Another crucial aspect that contributed to Resident Evil's major improvement is its mechanics and gameplay. Resident Evil's gameplay evolved over time, becoming more streamlined and user-friendly. It adapted to changing trends and player preferences while still retaining its core identity at the same time. It introduced free roaming cameras and more action-oriented controls, added different ways to deal with ammo and health, and even allowed players to team up for a different experience, such as the one in Resident Evil 5. On the other hand, Silent Hill remained stuck in its unique, but sometimes clunky, control scheme and puzzles. In fact, the controls got even more clunky in the installments that followed the first and second ones. Silent Hill 4 was an example of this. It was a game with an insanely creative setting, where you find yourself imprisoned in your apartment. It had an incredibly sophisticated and disturbing story, and one of the most memorable antagonists in gaming history. But the only reason that made players frustrated with it was the fact that the combat was a little bit weird and not straightforward. It slows down the momentum of the gameplay and leaves a bad taste in your mouth, regardless of how much you enjoy the story. Even though this was 20 years ago in 2004, this aspect actually got worse for the franchise in the years that followed, even in the last major installment of the series, Downpour, in 2012. Downpour is a game that failed catastrophically, even though it had a good story, a chilling atmosphere, and relatively good visuals. Players simply couldn't overlook how the gameplay and combat mechanics are literally a pain in the buttocks. Aiming mechanics made absolutely no sense because the game basically aims for you automatically and the large number of chase sequences and quick time events felt like something very repetitive for gamers in 2012. However, even though the awkward combat and controls were stressful for most gamers, some hardcore Silent Hill fans managed to turn it into a positive thing by considering it a part of the unique identity of the game. For them, the weird combat makes their journey harder, and that's something they love. This complicated perspective led Silent Hill to become more appealing to a very very specific group of gamers and less appealing to others who had already become used to modern mechanics and narratives. This leads us to the third element that pushed Silent Hill down in the commercial competition, but also pushed Resident Evil up. If you ask Silent Hill fans about one thing they loved the most about the franchise, I'm pretty sure the narrative would be an easy answer for the majority. But little did people know that the narrative was actually one of the reasons that led to Silent Hill's inability to reach new audiences as gaming in general changed. The narrative in Silent Hill was meant to be deep, complex and realistic, but in a disturbing way. It focuses on discomforting psychological themes like guilt, trauma, and how the human condition can be a double-edged sword. It intentionally wants to break your heart at some point, 
and make you feel that there's no happy ending to your journey. The upside of this narrative is that the exploration of complex emotions allows you to connect with the characters on a deeper level, which creates a more impactful and memorable experience. The psychological themes also offer a more mature and thought-provoking experience, compared to simpler jump scares or gore. On top of that, this focus sets Silent Hill apart from other horror games, appealing to players who seek something more than just scares or action. However, the problem with this type of narrative is the fact that not everyone enjoys or connects with deep psychological themes, making the game less accessible to a wider audience. Marketing a game based on complex emotions can be extremely challenging compared to focusing on jump scares or action because, as I said earlier, people love it when there's a lot of stuff going on on the screen. It's very hard to convince younger people to buy a Silent Hill game and expect them to fall in love with it as much as the hardcore fans do. Dad... You are a hero. The man who died... That wasn't my father. That isn't who I remember. Those memories are all I have. You're all I have. Resident Evil never had a problem with this aspect because it always offered more straightforward narratives, often involving corporations and conspiracies. And even if you don't like the story, the gameplay is enough to make you enjoy the experience because there's a lot to do and a lot of action to have. This crucial element led Silent Hill to achieve limited commercial success that doesn't match its insane popularity as a franchise or a trademark in gaming or entertainment in general. You mean the guy who lived here before? And it wasn't just him either. There's uh, something wrong with his whole apartment. This is why videos about Silent Hill stories have become so popular today. The new generations of gamers simply enjoy the lore and the interesting plot more than they enjoy playing the game themselves. And this is a bad thing for any franchise that's trying to survive financially. This takes us to the next element that hurt Silent Hill's success and made Resident Evil avoid the same fate. Making a masterpiece game is the goal of every gaming company, but with all the positive things that come with it, people don't realize that it also creates a challenge that can basically be the nightmare of the company for years. This chase has been entertaining, but even the greatest entertainments must come to an end. Silent Hill 2 was this type of game in the series. It was the masterpiece that blew up the franchise's popularity and literally took the entire horror gaming market by storm. People were not expecting this because the trailer didn't give any impression that the game was going to be this profound and psychologically perfect. It was one of the few games where the story and atmosphere were enough to make you fall in love with the experience, regardless of any mechanics or gameplay. However, Silent Hill 2 was the blessing that actually turned into a curse for the series, and it's all for one reason only. The reason, my friends, is that it was too good, and it raised the bar so high to the extent that even the developers who made it were worried that they could never match it in the next installments, let alone create something better. The expectations of the audience went through the roof because people automatically wanted the next Silent Hill games to be as good as the second one, and trust me when I tell you that this is a nightmare for developers. One of the hardest things in the gaming industry is consistency. And it gets even harder when the expectations of your fanbase are too high to reach. When Silent Hill 3 came out, people loved it, but there was always the idea that it wasn't better or equal to the previous one. The comparison was always there, no matter how gamers tried to avoid it. The game also achieved fewer sales, and this is something that forces developers to panic and gives them a clear hint that it's not an improvement. Silent Hill 2 sold 1 million copies after just one month of its release, 
while Silent Hill 3 sold only 300,000 copies in five months. I don't get it. This was one of the reasons that led them to make a twist in Silent Hill 4 and try to execute creative ideas that were never experienced in the series before, including making it the first game to not take place in Silent Hill Town. But sadly, this worked in the opposite direction, and many players felt that it was a deviation from what Silent Hill games were meant to be, and it eventually became the installment that literally ended the journey of Team Silent which is the Japanese development team that created the first four games of the series, also known as the golden era of the franchise. The guy who lives here, what's he like anyway? From this point on, Konami became desperate to revive the sales numbers and thought that hiring Western studios would help fix the problem. But little did they know, it basically accelerated the decline of this precious series until the apparent death that happened with Downpour in 2012. This is when Konami realized that they needed a savior who understood the audience, the market, and what new ideas could work in that era of gaming. And in a surprising twist, Konami actually made the right decision and hired the right person for the first time in years which was the one and only Hideo Kojima. This was when Silent Hill had a real chance of making a comeback and turning the tables on all the people who thought it was dead. In late 2012, Konami announced a project called Silent Hills that was going to be developed by Hideo Kojima Productions and directed by Hideo and filmmaker Del Toro. This news compelled the fanbase to believe that the change was finally happening but the excitement reached its highest level in August 2014, when PT was released to give players a taste of what's waiting for them in Silent Hills. I have already made a dedicated video about PT, in case you want to delve deeper into its story. But to summarize it, it was basically the earthquake that a franchise like Silent Hill needed. It was unique, creative, and extremely chilling, even when you can see nothing physical that can scare you. The psychological horror was insane, and everything felt so mysterious, which made players even more curious to understand what's happening around them. <laughs> But since Konami is the undisputed champion of ruining amazing things, this project was eventually cancelled in 2015, and we basically came back to where we started. The franchise was put on hold again, and its future was unclear and shrouded in mystery. Konami missed the chance of a revival when it was available, but what many of you might not know is that Capcom almost fell into the same trap. Just like Silent Hill 2 was the masterpiece that Konami couldn't replicate, Resident Evil 4 was also the masterpiece that made the other installments look like a downgrade. Resident Evil 4 was so revolutionary, to the extent that Resident Evil 5 was seen as a failure on multiple levels. But boy, the real disaster happened when Resident Evil 6 came out. This one was literally the most forgettable Resident Evil game for almost 90% of the fanbase. It had zero creativity, a boring story, and weird gameplay, which indicates that the franchise was really going in the wrong direction. This is when Capcom started to actually get worried, even though the game achieved a great deal of sales. Capcom understood that the majority of players had a negative impression and some of them began to believe that the series was becoming very repetitive. However, what happened next proved that Capcom did its research and tried to learn every freaking mistake that Konami made so they could avoid them. In fact, Capcom even got inspired by the PT idea and knew that Konami were idiots for abandoning that project. 
And by the way, this is not the first time Capcom has tried to get some ideas from the Silent Hill saga. Before Resident Evil 4 was created, the initial project was actually called Resident Evil 3.5, and the purpose of this game was to add psychological horror to the Resident Evil experience. Capcom was impressed by the success of Silent Hill 2 and wanted to add elements to Resident Evil that focus on touching your mind instead of just facing physical enemies. This game was designed to include ghosts, hallucinations, and more extreme themes that you could be familiar with in the Silent Hill franchise. However, this project was eventually cancelled due to creative differences between the developers. But this was not a bad thing at all, because the result was the creation of Resident Evil 4 instead. Ah, it's freezing. So cold all of a sudden. Ah, must be my imagination. But the surprising part is that Resident Evil 3.5 and PT were actually among the sources of inspiration that led Capcom to create the masterpiece that literally single-handedly saved the entire franchise from collapsing. This masterpiece, ladies and gentlemen, is none other than Resident Evil 7. It's a game that feels different than anything we've seen in the series before but it was created with such care and creativity in a way that people found themselves adapting to its new style in a heartbeat. It was a combination of first-person action, psychological horror, and incredible visuals that forced us to be impressed. The rest is history, because after Resident Evil 7, the series continued to achieve success with every game, both commercially and critically. Konami had the same chance to make this comeback with Silent Hills. They destroyed this chance by themselves, and this shows us that the difference between the companies also plays a role in the fate of their franchises. This leads us to the final point that I personally want to highlight about the upcoming Silent Hill 2 remake, and why I believe Bloober Team is in a weird situation where they can never please everyone, no matter how they try. To understand how the mind of a gaming company works, you need to first understand how the consumers think. And you also need to realize that not everyone thinks like you and shares your same passion. As much as many Silent Hill fans want to believe that anyone can see the deep value that the franchise can provide, most people would actually look the other way when it's about opening their wallets and buying it. Because as I said earlier, in order to make people buy a game, you need to create a reason that can push them to feel that it's worth it. The main target of every game company is not the hardcore fanbase. It's basically the outsiders who are not familiar with their game, because that's the only way they can expand their audience. This is what forces developers to sometimes prioritize making their games more fun instead of complicated, because they don't want to alienate the broader gaming community. The reason why Resident Evil gets tons of sales even when the game is bad is because the experience is always fun, despite all the flaws. Resident Evil is a game that you can enjoy personally, your spouse can enjoy, your children can enjoy, and even your parents can enjoy. It has the advantage of appealing to literally everyone because anyone who puts the controller in their hands can get direct enjoyment. The hard truth is that Silent Hill 2 doesn't have this advantage because it's incredibly deep and psychologically powerful to the extent that not anyone can understand it. It's basically suffering from its own success because being a perfect psychological horror game comes with a price. And that price is usually less sales, especially in a new generation. To help you understand what I mean, I'm going to use two other examples that I'm personally in love with and desperate to believe that they have a future. The first example is what I call a masterpiece in its category, which is the one and only Alan Wake. This is a game that I played in 2010, and I still remember to this day the rainy nights that I spent enjoying it and delving deep into its world. It felt very different and unlike any other survival horror game at that time. It's not about zombies or an apocalypse, it goes in completely different directions. 
where you need to find out what's actually happening around you as you progress. I also loved how the use of light and darkness as mechanics added a strategic and unique element to combat, making it more than just shooting enemies. But the real question is, did the vast majority of the gaming community see what I saw in this game and go buy it? Well, the answer is, heck no. The game was basically a mystery for more than 75% of gamers, and sales only started getting better after almost two years of its release. Marketing such a game with such story and vibes was so hard for publishers, because they needed to convince players that there is something more than action you can get from it. After more than 10 years, the sales have now reached 3.2 million, which is considered an insanely good number by its developers. But if you want to know how the market is not fair for such games, keep in mind that Resident Evil 6 sold more than 11 million copies without much effort, and despite being considered a bad game. You can find hundreds of videos on the internet talking about how good the game is. And you can also find most people in the comments agreeing with them, but that doesn't mean they will buy it. The second example I want to use is a game I'm replaying these days. And it was one of the titles that caught my eye immediately during the PS4 and Xbox One launches. This game is actually Murdered Soul Suspect. And believe me when I say that I was more excited about its trailer than anything else at that time. Even though E3 was full of cool stuff. The reason is simply that it was different. And as a horror gamer, that's what I always look for. If you don't believe me when I say that it was different, then please remember that this is a game where you play as a detective who got murdered. And his mission is to literally find his murderer, but in the afterlife. Here, you are a ghost who can use different abilities that can help you possess people or even read their minds to find evidence that can help you in your investigation. And to make things even more interesting, the events are set in Salem, Massachusetts, but it takes you back to the real era of witch trials, which is really enticing, especially when you realize that there are real life characters here. I'm actually planning to make a dedicated video about it soon, and that's why I'm replaying it these days. Anyway, long story short, no one bought this game during its launch except me and six random people somewhere on the planet. Even though I'm being sarcastic, the bitter truth is that it actually passed above the radar of everyone except a small, specific group of gamers who were interested in this niche. It didn't achieve any considerable sales, and in the last five years, the only channel that put the game on lists and recommended it to people on the entire YouTube platform is probably our channel. And by the way, this is not a perfect game by any means. And it definitely has many weaknesses that need improvement, but I really felt that it deserved a chance because I want to see this concept in gaming more. Now, it doesn't matter how much we praise it in videos or comments, the sale simply killed it and made any hope for a sequel disappear. This is why I really believe that the Silent Hill 2 remake is one of the toughest projects to handle. And I'm starting to put myself in Bloober's and Konami's shoes, to be honest. On one hand, they need to please a group of people who are asking to keep the remake entirely faithful to the original. But on the other hand, they also need to find a way to convince a much larger number of people to buy the game. And these people are not familiar with what made Silent Hill amazing in the first place. If you think about it from a company's perspective, you'll get why they might try to add more combat and action to the remake. They simply want a piece of the insanely big market that Resident Evil keeps getting sales from. They know that the hardcore fanbase is not enough to achieve unprecedented commercial success, and they need the new generations to be a part of the equation. We can understand this even more when we think about the age groups of gamers. Technically, the vast majority of Silent Hill fans who played the game during its launch are now in their 40s and 30s. And of course, there are the older gamers too. However, there's literally an entire generation of adults who were born after the original game, and they definitely have different perspectives about it. Konami knows that it doesn't make sense to achieve financial success from a game without including people who are in their 20s and even the younger ones in their target audience. 
They are afraid that even if they make the perfect game when it comes to being faithful to the original, they could simply fail commercially. And it will just be another source for good content on YouTube. And that's it. They also understand the sad truth about the gaming market, which is that people buy the games that they enjoy the most, and not the best games from an artistic perspective. This is the same reason why Call of Duty keeps selling every year, even though it's basically the same game, and it's getting worse too. To be honest, it's a very tricky situation, and I'm really starting to feel sorry for Bloober, because they are stuck in the middle and don't know whether to please Konami's commercial ambitions or the hardcore fanbase that has loved the game for decades. I'm really interested to know how they will pull it off, and I'm also interested in your opinion about this entire analysis. Tell me what you think about the comparison between Silent Hill and Resident Evil, and your personal ideas about why one declined and the other thrived. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like and wait for me in the next one.